the scripture reading for today is Exodus 16, 2 through 4, and 9 through 15. And also in the New Testament is John 6, 24 through 35. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us out into the wilderness to starve us all to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I am going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Then Moses said to Aaron, Announce this to the entire community of Israel. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard our complaining, or heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp, and the next morning the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance, as fine as frost, blanketed the ground. The Israelites puzzled what they saw when they saw it. What is it? they asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, It is the food the Lord has given you to eat. John six twenty four through 35 So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the, side of the, lake, on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said, "I, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread to eat every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The work God wants us to do is simply walking with him. Walk with God. Join God wherever God is going. Go with God, and everything we need will be provided for us. That's the promise anyway. That's the promise that we get from Scripture today. Walk with God, and we'll have food. Walk with God, and we'll have freedom. Walk with God, and we'll have good work, and enough to last a lifetime. And anything else we need or lack? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these other things will be given to you. Now, I'm not saying we should quit our day jobs and go live in a monastery or something. God has given us the desire to work, and work is good. But our perspective needs to shift just a little left of center of what we think when we think of work. Because here in Scripture, Jesus says, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Now, out of context, it looks like the only work you'll ever need to do is believe in Jesus. Woohoo! <laughs> I believe in Jesus. I've done my life's work. That was easy. Time to go home and wait to die and go to heaven or something. I guess, right? <laughs> no. No, that, that's not quite it. 
But in, in context, believing in means action. It means taking steps to follow where those beliefs take you. And today I'm replacing the words believing in God with walking with God, because when we believe in God, we take actions with God. We walk with Him through the storms of life, through everyday things, in our relationships with those we love, or even the ones we don't. We, we walk with God. That is our life's work. And the work God wants us to do is simply walking with Him. Back in the Old Testament, God told the prophet Micah to tell the people of Israel this, specifically. The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what the Lord requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And if you think about it, you don't even have to worry about the first two parts if you do the third part, walking with God. See, right there, let me read that again. Number one, do what is right. And number two, love mercy. I mean, if you're walking with God like a child is walking with their parents, and are, are you likely to do what's wrong right in front of them? No. A child instinctive, is instinctively on their best behavior and does what is right when they are walking closely with their parents. At least with a good, respectable parent like God is. And if you're walking with the King of grace and mercy, the one who is cons constantly and consistently showing you examples of that same grace and mercy, are you likely to hate and shun such grace? Or are you more likely to embrace it? I think you'll embrace it. And while walking with God, He will show you how to emulate His mercy in such a way that it becomes second nature to you. In fact, over time, giving out mercy will be more than second nature to you, as God will rewrite and recreate a new nature within you. And there inside of you, we can see God at work, as He is everywhere, working to recreate a little bit of heaven on earth in your own heart to make the whole world as God had originally designed it, as it should be, as you are designed it to be. Yes, you are designed to walk with God, love mercy, and to do what is right. You will feel right and at home when you walk with God. But lest I make everyone think this journey with e at Jesus is easy, I want to say from personal experience, walking with God is, is hard work. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong or something. Because Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, or the, the work I put on your shoulders, is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. That, I mean, that's what Jesus promises anyway. That's what He says. So, so, if you've ever had the temptation to shoot the messenger, please don't shoot me. I, I warn you a little bit, that is not super easy to hear an invisible God. It's literally hard to walk with someone who is invisible. You might ask God to show you a sign, and it's really hard to tell whether it's God or just dumb luck. But, can I tell you something? I've noticed something. It, I, I'm guessing here. So... I'm guessing that God has learned from experience that God doing miracles, even bold face, in your face miracles, doesn't seem to do any good. I think after a few thousand years of dealing with people, even God's own people, that it's just as hard for God to feel the pain of rejection as it is for you or I to feel rejected. I say that because God can make anything in the world come to be, but being loved without coercion I think that's one of the rare things that I'm guessing. Now, I said I'm guessing that it doesn't come easy for God. But I meant that comment I just made. I, 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 when Jesus said, come to me all who are weary, that passage was in, was in Matthew, directly after Jesus 
basically cursed a whole town for not believing any of the miracles that were performed there. I mean, Jesus performed miracle after miracle and they just, they wouldn't accept him. And it happens time and time again. Today's Old Testament reading is about a miracle of God feeding the Israelites bread from heaven and meat with the quail. Let's put ourselves in the story. Let's imagine ourselves as the Israelites. We just saw our enemy swallowed up by a wall of water. We ourselves just walked through. We were just miraculously set free from slavery from the Egyptians. And we were walking with God. God was happy. He was parading around in front of us as a cloud of smoke in the day and an awesome cloud of fire at night. I mean, we felt the presence of God with us wherever we went. And we were getting thirsty, too. Uh-oh. What, what are we going to do? It, it's understandable. I'd be complaining, too. Food is important. I get hangry. <laughs> And good, and a good and loving parent like God provides food to their kids. And, and I have no doubt that we would have been fed, that the Israelites would have been fed well, because when we walk with God, we'll have food. Jesus said it himself in Matthew 7, 9 through 11. You, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or, or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? Walk with God and we'll have food. Walk out in faith and your needs will be met. Now the Israelites in the Old Testament were walking with God, but they were getting hungry, very hungry. And if you've ever noticed protesters or at assemblies, you'll always find the group as a whole not saying so much, but the, they all still have strong opinions. It's more often seen, on the other hand, one or two people trying to speak for the entire group. And more often than we would like, it seems that these, the loudest voices, it's those who say the extreme things the hyperbola of what the truth is that we're all feeling. And I think that's what I believe was going on here in the Old Testament passage about the manna. I mean, one very hungry and agitated Israelite, probably one of Aaron's own sons, stood above the rest and spoke for the crowd. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you, Moses? You've brought us in the wilderness to starve us all to death. Oi vey, Aaron, is that your kid? Which, which one of them, which one of the sons is it? I, I can't tell from here. If that's one of your sons, Aaron, just make sure he's leading the people in the right way. I know you've been training them to be leaders since we've taken on the responsibility with Moses and all, but they're going to rile up the crowds in bad ways. They're likely to get us all killed. Uh, if the anger of the Lord should, should be riled up somehow, we were just rescued from slavery. That meant that meat they say we were eating was tainted with our own family's own bloodshed and slavery. They should know better than this, Aaron. The Lord will provide us some food. We've only got to trust the Lord. Oh, oh, shh, sh sh I think I see Moses his, with his eyes closed. His hands are lifted up to heaven in a posture of prayer. I think God has heard us, all of our needs, through your sons. Oh, I was wrong. Good job, Aaron. I knew your kids would be fine leaders someday. Listen, I think I can even hear the voice of God. This is so exciting and a little bit terrifying. Wait, I think, I think he said, I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Wait, what a test? Come on, Aaron, a test? Why is God testing us? We're all hungry and a little on the edge here. All we want is some food. Oh, and that makes sense now. I see. The Lord is wise beyond all ages. Yes, if all we want is food, then what we are saying is we don't need the Lord. We only want the food. 
If all we want is food, then the food is an idol, is our idol, and we are sinning against the Lord. It is good and right that the Lord test us. Holy is his name. Your desires, our desires, need to be more than the food we eat, or the house we live in, or the responsibilities we think are so important. Above it all, our life's work is to humbly walk with God. To see the unseen and follow God is work enough for anybody. But when we do walk with God, we will have food. The Lord provides. And even if God doesn't provide the basics, the things we need to live, and by some fluke of bad luck or by the hands of evil people who do wrong, when we find ourselves without basic needs, we will find ourselves at minimum satisfied with Jesus. For he says, I am the bread of life. Look, he did it again. Jesus said, the I am is the bread of life. Like he declared himself to be the I am. Well, because he is. And by walking with him, you will be satisfied. Even unto death, as many Christians have gone on before us, facing the lions, facing evil kingdoms and governments, facing the evil ones face to face, we will go down satisfied with God by our side and in our hearts. Generally, God does meet our needs, but even amidst the fluke or evil, God is there with us, and that is all we need. On the complete other side of the spectrum, if you could be a millionaire and fly yourselves into the heavens looking for something to satisfy you, and God is not with you, you will never be satisfied because you were designed to walk with God, simply, humbly, daily. We are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And in that prayer, we can sense God's deep longing to fulfill in us our own deepest longing. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we are echoing the words that God has wanted our own mouths to utter. We know that God wants us to pray this prayer because the disciples ask, Jesus, how should we pray? And that was Jesus' answer. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord of all things, invisible and visible. Who cr could create anything by speaking it into existence, simply wants to walk with you. The Lord, our daily bread, satisfying everything we need as we walk with Him. The I Am is enough. But that's not all, as the infomercial, infomercial man would say. Walk with God and you'll have freedom. I want to go a little different direction with this one. I usually don't like to go into the negative or pointing out other people's negatives. But I, I've got to tell you, reading myself into these stories is tough. Did you see how I did a little pivot in my imagin imaginative illustration of Aaron's sons complaining about not having enough food? <laughs> well... I just don't want to imagine myself as a whiny person begging to go back into slavery just so I can get some food. I don't want to imagine myself as, as that guy. Ugh, it's so embarrassing. I'd much, rather, I'd much rather make fun of someone else's kid than to imagine myself so desperate for the comforts of a meal that I sacrifice my own freedoms. But the truth is, when we read the Bible, it is best to read ourselves in all the different characters because it highlights all the various places and emotions we find ourselves through throughout our life. And haven't we acted like these whiny Israelites, murmuring and complaining to God, making hyperbolic and inflammatory statements so that we can be heard? Well, we are God's children, and God is mature enough to take it. So, I won't fault us for acting out in our needs. We are just children in His eyes, and He loves us, and He can handle our complaints. But back to the scene, back in the desert with the whiny Israelites, all of that complaining and wanting and yearning, explaining their desires to be heard, held in slavery again, reminds me so much of my own addictions. And I don't know about you, but my brain connects things that sometimes aren't related, and you might not see a connection between the Israelites wanting meat and bread and the addictions that I, and maybe that we, struggle with. But 
but that feeling of being stuck and of wanting that stuckness again, just so I can feel happy in one small area of my life. I know what that's like. And that scenario is related in my mind. I, I don't think it's too far off to say that the Israelites, especially the ones begging to go back into slavery for the momentary pleasures of meat and bread, without even asking God for help, that is so much like a lot of modern day addictions that I have to draw the parallels. The Israelites said with their very own mouths that they wanted back in Egypt so they could have bread and meat, regardless of the fact that to do so would mean slavery. And it just seems like the slavery we are willing to put ourselves in to get that feel-good chemical in our brains, it's a lot like that. But Mr. Forrest, you might say, the Israelites were freed from their slavery and I have not been freed yet. You might say, I'm still trapped in my addictions. I know. It's hard. Our minds need healing. It will take time. Don't forget about the 40 years in the desert that God made the Israelites walk before him before they could even enter the promised land. We always want the promised land. Of course we want the promised land. It's, a, it's quite an amazing gift. But the gift of the promised land was not the gift. The giver of the promised land was the gift. And today, the gifts that you have are not the gift. The giver is the gift. I'm going to sound like some weird hippie man up here if I say that it's this way, but it's not the destination, it's the journey, man. And the journey isn't even the destination, it's who you are journeying with. That is the destination. So it sounds a little like overly manufactured profundity to me, but in this case of addictions and hangups, oh, what does that all mean? Anything is possible with God. And I honestly think that a good and loving parent, a, a father, a mother, or God, doesn't want you stuck. Change to your addictions. Your addiction is your imprisonment. and You are a slave to your hang-ups and addictions. The Apostle Paul writes something about this in Romans, and it reads so powerfully. Let me just read it here. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war in my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Walk with God and we'll have freedom. Amen? Amen. What, what are you stuck in? What are your addictions that you are wallowing in which lead to death? Christ wants you to be free of those. Jesus talked about how he was the bread of life, who gives life to the world. And here, Paul is talking about the life-giving spirit that frees you from the power of sin and addictions that lead to death. Jesus' spirit is the Holy Spirit. And he freely gives you the Holy Spirit without hesitation so that you will have freedom. But perhaps, not in a way in which you receive the gift of freedom and then go home and wait to die to get the promised land. The gift is, is the giver himself. That is the gift. The destination is who you are journeying with. It's complicated, but I think you're getting it. Walk with God and we'll have freedom. Walk with God and God will give you what you need. 
walk with us as we walk with God together. Let's, let's sort this out together. Seek help. You can heal. Seek professionals. It will get better. The gift giver will give you the freedom that you need, but even if not, the giver is enough. For you were designed to walk with God. Now we get to go and to walk with God and we'll have work. And work is one of those things that is good. Work is good. Even in the story of the Garden of Eden, we do not see monkeys in the garden fanning Adam and Eve while they lay naked on banana leaves, uh, being fed bunches of grapes. Eden is not a hedonistic paradise devoid of work. The story goes, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. God gave Adam and Eve a job to do. Eden was a garden, a place of good, hard work. And it seems from our creation narrative that we are designed to work. The creation narrative we have was written in a culture when the neighboring nations actually had different and competing creation narratives. And their creation stories told people working too, only the purpose was completely different. In the creation narratives of other cultures at the time that our Mosaic or Pentateuch version was circulating via word of mouth, their creation narrative said that humans were made by the gods to serve the gods who created people for their own pleasure. We were meant to be slaves, their story said. Work and work hard, for this is what the gods demand. And of course, who but the religious leaders of their time profited from such a model? Of course they did. How convenient, how devious. <laughs> but this is not the way our creation story is written. No. Think of how mind-blowing a narrative our story would be on the ears of a neighboring nation. What? They might say. Your God created you because, well, just because? Mm-hmm. Yep. And you don't have to give gifts to the gods to appease their anger and wrath? Uh, no. Why? Do yours? Yes, and we never get a break. Well, that's sad. Our God says we can take a break. No, more than that, God has asked us to take a break. A whole day off a week. Oh man, you're lucky. Are there any ceremonies or rules I have to obey before I can join your nation? Mm, circumcision and the Ten Commandments won't be written for another thousand years or, or, or whatever, so nope, not yet. Ha, sounds good. Okay, wait, wait circum what? <laughs> okay, so... They had a long way to go before any rules are set in place or on what it means to be a part of this story. But still, the amazing freedom and peace such a creation story would have offered their world must have been like a breath of fresh air. Back then, as it is now, everyone would have acknowledged that we all have work to do. That's a given. But the idea that the purpose of work is not to serve a gaggle of demanding overlord gods but simply because it's how we maintain, steward, and live in this beautiful place that God has placed us to enjoy the good things that He created. That idea is such good news in comparison to whatever else was available at the time. And in the Garden of Eden, it is said that Adam and Eve walked with God. Are you feeling any connections to our main point? Walk with God and we'll have work. And the world has obviously changed over the years. Our world is different than it was just five years ago, let alone 5,000 years ago. But we still have the same task and a purpose from God. Regardless of how it became broken, our world has a lot of brokenness in it. Don't you agree? And God has set you here in this place to walk with God and to work with God in, in fact, God has been working from day one, trying to make the world a better place. He's asking us to partner with Him in His mission. Our Father, which is in heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These are Jesus' words. This is our life's work, to find what God is doing in the world and join in that mission. Every broken place is to be healed. Every dark place is to be brought out into the light. 
Every sickness is to be healed. Every dead body is to be raised back to life again. No more suffering. No more pain. This is our end goal. The mission we are on is from God and with God. And there's enough work to do. Work enough to last a lifetime. And it's not drudgery work either. It's awesome, exhilarating, life-giving work. We are designed for this. Even if somehow you are listening to this as an atheist or something, you cannot deny that humans are excellent at cooperation, working together to accomplish a goal that is far bigger than ourselves alone. We work best as a colony, as a collective. And if you notice, we are in this together. We aren't doing this work or this life alone. This isn't a Jesus and me thing. It's not a Jesus and me and no room for three mentality at all. The church itself is a collective. Jesus says, what makes a gathering a thing of any significance is very much specifically more than just you and Jesus alone. Matthew's gospel says, Jesus says this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered as my followers, I am there among them. So church, we've got a massive amount of work to do. And of course, I wish it was as easy as asking two of you to agree that climate change needs to stop and all of a sudden it stops. I wish it was as easily as two of you agreeing that a beloved one just not die and they would be completely fine. But I also know that God gave us work to do and that work is good. Even when nothing is broken, there's not a fire that needs to be put out or an emergency to overcome. Work is good. God designed us for work. But God did not design our work to serve Him, but to serve one another. Remember, I believe that our creation narrative itself was written as a response to the neighboring nations' messed up views about what work is. As a posture of slavery to the gods? No. Our creation story Response is a posture of freedom. Paul says in Galatians, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Serve one another in love. It sounds like work. Walk with God and we'll have work. It's good work, refreshing and life-giving work. Work enough to last us a lifetime. What work is God calling us to do as we walk with God? Regardless of what it is, we will have whatever we need because when we seek first the kingdom of God, all of these things will be given to us. The only thing we lack is to take some time and pray and ask that we can see where God is already at work around us and ask that we walk and work with God. That's it. So let's pray. Okay. Lord, here we are. Wherever we find ourselves today, you are with us. Help open our eyes to all that you are doing around us today. Show us those places that are available to needing a helping hand. Or show us where we can use our skills that are life-giving to ourselves and are also life-giving to others. You have designed us to work, and I believe you've even designed us for specific tasks. And we are a body of believers um, can find ourselves as a hand or a foot or an eyeball or a listening ear. Together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can bless the world. And what's more, Lord, you promised that we would do even greater things on earth than you had done in and through Jesus. I am so excited to see those miracles being done, yet I am also a doubter like Thomas. And you've never chastised Thomas about his doubts. In fact, you invited him to touch the holes in your hands and your sides. You didn't even ask Thomas to wash his hands first. Jesus, that's unsanitary. Oh my goodness. So may we be so bold as to trust that you are as loving and kind with us when we have our own doubts following you and trusting in your promise one step at a time, walking daily with you. This is our gift to you, our faith, stepping out following where we think that you are leading us. Thank you, Lord.